great panel that is called Responsible Offensive Machine Learning. And here we have um, Bodicea, Filar, and Straith, and we have our Delta Zero moderating. So take it away. All right, uh, let's just uh, really quick have a time for the panelists to introduce themselves. Um, to start, what are you working on today and what path did you take to get there? So hi everyone, I'm Straith. Uh, primarily what I work on is using robots to social engineer people. Um, so physical robots and you know getting people to do things they wouldn't otherwise do or say things they wouldn't otherwise do. And my path here has been really weird. Um, started in business <laughs> and then went through to project management and then to IT help desk and then university where I did theoretical computer science and robotics. And now I'm in a cryptography security and privacy lab. None of those words are AI or machine learning, <laughs> but I've kind of done a little bit along the way. And obviously it does feed into the robot social engineering. Hi, I'm uh, Bobby Feiler, data scientist at Endgame. Uh, my primary responsibility there is building malware classification models, um, employing NLP to try to help security analysts do their job faster, uh, easier. My path here, uh, equally kind of bizarre, uh, international relations background, I wanted to write about North Korea nuclear weapons. Uh, now I'm on stage talking about offensive AI. Um, yeah, so I jumped from kind of the policy side of the house to geospatial analytics, uh, then into information security, and then into information security data science. So I'm Sarah Turp. I'm a data scientist. I work for a very large ad tech company. So my day job, I'm going through very fast, very, very large amounts of data, trying to get more people to look at videos, to the ends of videos, which bores the hell out of me sometimes. So as a hobby, I track um, misinformation, very large-scale bots, troll activity, and work out counters to that. And I got there, God, I can remember being a kid, I couldn't decide whether to do psychology or computing, and then discovered AI. Um, first job, I refused to go to university, so I went straight to a graduate job designing sonar systems and intelligent torpedoes, got one of the very first AI degrees in the world. We we're talking 30-something years ago. Um, and just no, unmanned vehicles, intelligent systems, just fun stuff. If it looks like fun, I do it. Awesome. So starting right into things, during the past week at Black Hat, DEF CON, and B-Sides, we've seen quite a number of examples of like offensive ML, adversarial examples, things like that. Um, what concerns you the most in the whole ML, AI, InfoSec intersection? Uh, the biggest thing that concerns me is probably the marketing of AI and ML. Uh, <laughs> so I'll, I'll make sure to apologize to our marketing department. But in, in reality, it is. It's often positioned as like a silver bullet uh, that can solve or catch anything, that it can reduce all of your data and produce no false positives. And that sort of uh, kind of definition is, is dangerous because then people start to believe it and spend a lot of resources, both people and money, on things that don't solve everything. Well, and can we talk about the training data sets that are used for all of these companies that are adding in AI and machine learning? Like my favorite thing has been walking around vendor areas and saying, hey, how do you train your systems? Like, how do you feel about that sort of stuff too? Oh boy, I've got a long story about that one. <laughs> um, sorry, human inputs, uh, very bad bias. So my, my biggest worry is that we're getting a lot better at replicating the appearance of being human. And yeah, I know it's all like sort of Terminator AI type stuff, but I, I build this crap. And there is a danger of not really, people not being ready and not knowing how to work with bots that aren't necessarily labeled. Um, this is called autonomy theory. We've, we've had a lot of it in um, some of the work on unmanned vehicles for years, but it's really hitting at scale now. And so that brings up something else is the thing that worries me the most is people constantly think of AI and they jump right to t being a Terminator, right? Is once you put an AI in a body, it's very, very different. Um, and to me, what like seeing what everybody's doing in AI and machine learning, the biggest threat is like the social and cultural impact, not what happens after you put it into a body 
yet, which is why I'm working on the robot social engineering. But the idea that AI and machine learning is already affecting us now, and I don't think people understand how much it's affecting us because they haven't physically seen it. Um, so it worries me that people are waiting too much for the physical impacts before they see the cultural and social. Actually, on that same note, what are the impacts of AI ML and how do we actually keep them ethical and fair? So I think the, the idea of keeping things ethical and fair uh, is, is certainly a difficult one. I believe it was you who had a presentation last year on uh, phishing, using targeting phishing, using AI and ML, where you mine publicly available information to create a kind of curated target set and exploit individuals to gain access and, and kind of take advantage. Ethical failure, you're only as good as your inputs. Um, I am seeing so many groups using human-generated, internet-generated inputs, which are by themselves usually like, come on, let's talk sexist, racist, and all of the other bads. I, I know Tay was um, engineered to be a racist asshole, but there's a lot of that going on. Um, so... Can you repeat the question? Uh, yeah, so what are the impacts of AI and ML, and how do we keep them ethical and fair? Oh yeah, that question. So what worries me is what we count as ethical and fair. Understanding what is fair for one person is not fair for another person. It is not necessarily ethical for another person. And it really worries me what we are doing in North America or even in certain subgroups and how specific the AI and machine learning is getting for uh, one uh, task, but then you try and put that machine learning anywhere else and it could actually harm people or hurt them. So I'm definitely worried about the uh, con contextualization of these tools. Let's kind of talk about definition of ethics. So I've worked a lot on data ethics. So what it means to be ethical when you're using data about people, e even before you start machine learning on top. and. The framing that I use that uh, seems to stick most is of ethics as a risk problem. So ethics is all about there is a risk to people. So you have a population, you have a risk of something, you have the probability of that risk. And then you can start talking about relative risks and relative problems and relative populations. Without that, you're just waving your hands in the air and saying, it's not fair. <laughs> Yeah, and piling onto the fair argument that I, I believe Straith was making, uh, explainability is certainly something that at least us in the InfoSec group uh, strives to do because black box can be extremely dangerous when you are producing some sort of output based off of uh, math and stats uh, that a human being then makes a decision on that could have actual dollar ramifications. Um, so when you look at things from, through that lens, you have to be much more careful. Well, life as well as health. Yeah, so um, money is one factor, but there are so many other factors, um, especially when we start looking at some of the tools we are making and, and how they impact, for example, even uh, LGBTQ++ groups and how their model is different, even though they might be in the same house as somebody else that the uh, tools might be working for. So that worries me, too, is that even when you have a contextualized in one specific spot, just somebody's personal experiences can change things so much. And then it's not even a deliberate offensive machine learning. It's accidental or like non-conscious, which is almost worse to me. Awesome. Very cool. Um, so on the next talk, um, so obviously we're, we're moving towards the future, like ML, AI robots are, are becoming more widespread. Um, how will different teams, say red teams, blue teams, or even other fields need to adjust for the future? So, yeah, I, I think the red team, blue team conversation is probably something that folks in here are, are interested in as well. Um, I think putting together solid red and blue teams is, is pretty much the same way you put together a solid basketball team. Everybody kind of has a role and responsibility. And the advent of ML-backed platforms, particularly in the security space, means that you will likely need to have a, uh, a resident expert on AI and how to exploit that on the red side. And on the blue side, when you're paying vendors uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars for ML-backed security, you're going to need to understand the underlying blind spots and, and problem areas and how to debug these machine learning models. 
I mean, hell, when we say ML and m most of the stuff out there, it's like, hey, we've got a table. We've got some labels. Let's go like put the thing together. Um, so this is not exactly complicated yet. What was the question again? <laughs> How will other teams, like red team, oh, blue red team, team, blue team? Um, so I've been through quite a few industries that we've added data science and ML into. Uh, one, my job used to be a consultant going in and changing organizations. And what you see is changes in not just the technologies, um, but you're talking about the speed you can do things, the scale you can do things with the types of data you can start using. It's like log files are boring as hell, but when you get enough of them together, it gets interesting. And there's always this sense of transformations of people, process, technology, culture. All of those change. The skills people have change because they have to be able to, 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 to understand the vulnerabilities within their own algorithms. They have to understand how to attack similar things. And Okay, I can see Straith itching to get the microphone. I'll stop for the moment. You can go red. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other interesting thing with this, too, is um, when we're looking at red teams and blue teams, we're usually talking about corporations and large groups and communities, right? But a lot of uh, stuff you've talked about in the past uh, few days, if anybody's had a chance to see, is uh, social bots, uh, especially on platforms like Twitter and Facebook, and how they're getting people individually, and how they're getting... Um, like the individual so how do you red and blue team for yourself too right and a lot of it comes down to uh trying to develop communities around you know blue team and community to protect your friends and family and and Country. countries too like what can we all be doing individually to be like hey stop that um so this is something to think about too is is with how the social bots are being integrated into our lives, um, we each need to start taking a role in this and not just leaving it to the companies, not just leaving it to the platforms, but also judging for yourself who is a bot, who is not a bot, and going through and seeing whether you can help parse that out for other people and prevent it, which is why this is now going back to Sarah. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, one of the things I want to talk about is subtlety. So one of the things that if you're starting to use machine learning, you're starting to use AI instead of like humans putting the buttons, is you can do much more interesting, complex, under the radar attacks. So at the moment, the botnets that I've been tracking have been pretty fucking dumb. Um, sorry, I swear every talk, I'm done. Um, so they've been pretty dumb. It's, it's like, hey, let's just like retweet this thing. Um, they're pretty easy to find, but once you can start adapting, so you can take natural language in, you can generate out, uh, once you can start randomly creating um, patterns of behavior that are more human-like, that are more random, it makes my job as a hunter a lot harder. And it's that arms war that I'm expecting over the next year between the bot makers and the bot finders, using machine learning on either side and starting to race up, up that chain. So it's going to get interesting. And yes, that hits individuals as well as groups, as well as countries, as well as it is, the, the surface is enormous. You should say something. Something. <laughs> something. No, I, I, I guess my question to you then would be when you look at things, and Ariel mentioned this as well with deep fakes, and there was the, uh, the Jordan Peele, Barack Obama sort of fusion, or my favorite, uh, Nick Cage, Donald Trump which was fantastic. Um, how do we, ball. Yeah. <laughs> not quite that good yet, but uh, what, what steps would you recommend to kind of the, the lay person to educate and arm themselves? Because I, I think for a lot of people here who are, are very well guarded in the information security space and know how to handle themselves at places like DEF CON or in day to day interactions, when you remove yourself into a more uh, political or geopolitical spectrum uh, and, and open yourself up to these uh, alternate media streams and, and things like that, there's that's kind of a lot to expect of people to to understand. So this is something I touch on a lot with the robot social engineering is because most of it is one on one because it's a physical robot and a physical human uh, in a space interacting with with each other socially. So talking, um, you know, body posturing is huge with robots, like being able to use body language. That's primarily uh, the advantage of uh, physical embodiment for uh, AI over versus when it's on the Web. And for that, there's not a lot you can do like I've been trying to write this defenses chapter in my thesis and it's just like magical like awareness will solve everything because there's just not a lot 
otherwise that you can do. Um, I've been doing some experiments on whether people can tell the difference between when a robot is acting on its own and when it's being controlled by a human. And the answer is no. Like so far, there's been no distinction between the two. People can't tell me when, hey, that robot, it's acting weird. They think it's a bug before they think it's another human. Um, or else they don't even think it's a bug. They're like, oh, that's a feature. Um, <laughs> so this is a thing too, is, is depending on how the uh, AI is presented, um, people usually can't tell the difference as soon as it's in a body because they prescribe so much more um, like lifelikeness to the robots. So this is something specifically from my area that concerns me about AI and machine learning is people don't know the difference between that and real. Yeah, I mean, really, I mean, we, we look on two different axes. So this is, comes from my old school intelligence training. It's like you always look at the content and the source. So the content of something isn't enough anymore. You need to know the context around it. Now, where does it come from? What is this trust framework I'm within? And there are media literacy trainings on how to start spotting things, but you now things like deep fakes. I mean, I, I, I've had a little play. I, I'm good at uh, image processing, and I've, I've reused some old um, mind-finding um, software t stuff, and it, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy to spot. I mean, you end up then doing common sense. You look at things like Snopes. But if you're trying to protect that group of humans, and those humans that where, 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 where is the, act, the attack surface generally, that you've just got to go all the way back the supply chain and stop this stuff before it gets to the humans. Because they're the they they are really a very last resort. Yeah, actually, that's really intriguing. Just generally, because like I, I know in my own research, um, it's really hard to sort of spot like you know spear phishing or audio um, like generated. Um, I'd I'd love to hear more just on the idea of like what happens if it's impossible to actually detect this stuff? Like, um, I know your research in, you know, stopping it from the source. Can you just expand a bit? Like, <laughs> this is probably not the place we recorded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, there was, there's a certain building in St. Petersburg that if it accidentally disappeared, life would get an awful lot easier for me. But uh, that's part of the chain. So you've got the people who are generating, the people who are pushing out, you have bot, bot, mini, bot application, you have the people at the end who are then applying on top. So it literally is a chain of information that you need to, at every point, yeah. find places to stop it, find ways to stop it. And at the end with the people, I mean, you can do like domain squatting and um, typo squatting and diversions. So there's a whole pile of, and that's, that's, an, that's an entire different talk okay. onwards. <laughs> and this is something you and I have discussed like outside um, but the idea of whether we want to be able to use that metadata to find bots like we also want anonymity for people we want like there are some cases where you know having that metadata it can harm people so if we start stripping all that out in an effort to protect individuals and have a more like free internet or however you want to think about what information we release while we're doing things, you use a lot of that to find bots. So once, like, if that is gone and if we have a more anonymous internet, like, how are we going to be able to tell between people and bots and where does that start affecting our culture more than it is already too, right? Yeah, and, and bringing this back to kind of the infosec problem, and, and for me, uh, malware classification, that's where the onus falls on, on, on folks in the crowd, uh, fellow data scientists, where you have to participate in this sort of research, adversarial machine learning, um, as you could tell by the track list over the past two days, uh, pretty heavy on that side. And the reason why it's so powerful is, is not because it's cool to make stickers to trick uh, a machine into thinking you're a toaster. It's about identifying your model's blind spots. And once you can identify those blind spots, you can attempt to patch them. And by patching them, you help make that platform more secure and, and hopefully, in theory, uh, organizations, people, uh, what have you, more secure. Well, there's also the human blind spots. One of the beautiful things about doing machine learning is you start learning where the people have missed things. It's kind of cool. Yeah. Awesome. So on that same note, actually, let's, let's move things more to the responsibility side. Um, for people creating you know, AI ML systems, what responsibilities do they have when creating those systems, whether they're blue team, red team, or anyone? 
Yeah, I'll take first crack here. Uh, so for me personally, it's a lot of eliminating things. So eliminating false positives to try to uh, engender like trust and, and make people believe that the answer coming out of these systems is, is fair and, and trustworthy. Um, trying to reduce kind of the black box feel of it. Uh, explainable AI, as I said earlier, is, is a huge thing. Uh, the majority of the industry right now uses tree-based classifiers, which should ensure at least some sort of explainability uh, based off the features they're using and, and things like that. And then the last thing I believe uh, Straith harped on, which is eliminating bias in, in your training data. So for me, bias isn't necessarily uh, gender or, or anything like that, but it could be nationality based, uh, language packs and software. A lot of uh, malware comes from Eastern Europe. So we don't want to create models that the first time it sees anything from Eastern Europe that is like a browser or a plugin, that it immediately labels it bad just because so much of our training data is, oh, if Russia, uh, that's definitely bad. So that's that's not an ideal thing. And that can lead to a lot of uh, problems, both within uh, international organizations and just developers trying to, to do right by themselves to create software. And we're back to risk equations. So you're actually talking about false posit positives. Actually, I, I've worked with a bunch of Nigerian tech people as well. It's the same problem, of like nobody will answer them. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Lagos. Um, so you've got to think about what the inherent harm is in your false positives and your false negatives and which way you should shift to keep the harm down. So that's like if, I mean, in terms of bots, quite, we quite often catch real human beings who are just enough on the borderline that the, that the list put out by Congress had a bunch of human beings in it. Their lives can get completely screwed by that. Um, but all, the other way, if you don't catch a major bot that's causing a lot of harm or a major incursion, then you're screwed that way. So it's like, who are the harms to? What are the, what are the risks? What is the cost? And not just in money, but the cost in general of doing this or not doing this, of those parameters you're using. Let's actually move it like back to robots, actually. If I'm designing a robot, do I have any sort of responsibilities or anything in that sense? I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Let's move it back to, like, for example, robots. Um, if, if I'm designing a robot, are there any responsibilities that I should have or should follow in order to, you know, um, I don't know, try to not deceive people or anything? So there's some interesting things with robots. Um, <laughs> Most of it is not AI or machine learning related, but uh, more in how the robot is perceived by people. So some of the things that really bother me are robots that are heavily gendered and put into gender specific roles. So we have a lot of female robots that are servants, waitresses, and all of, all of that sort of thing. That bothers me um, because then you have the male robots, which are being trained as managers, are being trained to um, be in positions of authority, but they have huge biceps. They're built like football players. They have like they have a like huge crotch area. It's like it's a robot. <laughs> Could we not? <laughs> <laughs> or it's like, why does the waitress robot need huge tits? They're like. I mean, they're hard plastic. Um, there's usually a tablet in front of them anyway. So it's like, why is this happening? So when you start doing that and you throw uh, AI in it, you also get a bunch of really interesting uh, interesting quirks um, in how people perceive what the robot is doing. So if um, the robot does not act like the gender that it's perceived as, people also treat it differently, which is kind of neat. Um, they get really confused about what role the robot has which needs more research, but so far the papers are just really neat. Um, the other thing too is uh, how we do voices with AI or what we name our AI assistants, Siri, <laughs> um, like female name, again, kind of like another thing that, why isn't it called like Jeff? I'd love an AI called Jeff. <laughs> Be like, Jeff, can you check my calendar for me today? Although I'm sorry if anybody here is named Jeff. Uh, <laughs> but this is the thing is like, you know, I love being able to change the voice uh, on my assistant as well, but like how many people change it and stick with a male voice or stick with um, a neutral voice, right? They're usually female as well. Like if you go to the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, there's Watson in the room, male voice, but then the uh, AI that controls the lights is a female voice. And it's like, why wasn't it the same? Why wasn't it, you know, 
what other options could happen and how does that affect people? But then I use that for social engineering and messing with people more because when they're like, oh, it's such a cute robot. Oh, she's like so tiny. And it's like, yeah, she's going to fuck up your day. <laughs> there is kind of an, a could you not element. So I was just remembering something I did for my last last but one company. So I was using all the security logs. I was looking for anomalous um, behaviors of humans or, or maybe humans. Um, so I had all the logs across all our systems and I started finding stuff out about my team that maybe I didn't want to know. There were specific members of my team doing some really interesting stuff, but then you could find out through the, you know, just going through the activity they had. It's like, I know who's awake when, I know there's some interesting curves going on there, I know some interesting correlations. Oh, look, I can go use some open data to go find some more about them. It, it was getting a little bit creepy. And some of it is like, how far do you go to protect your system? And in this case, it was like I had to track my own team to be able to spot anomalous anomalies and other parts of the team and to spot whether any of my team's accesses changed to a point where I had to worry about them. No, super users. You don't want them going rogue. But do you do it? Yeah, I, I mean, if anybody here works on insider threat problems, you'll know that, uh, yeah, somebody's shaking their head. It's incredibly creepy how insider threat programs work because they need to know every single thing. Uh, when you log on, when you log off, when you use the restroom, what do you print, when are you on Gmail? And when you get to that sort of level, it creates, uh, I think, an interesting moral dilemma about uh, security versus privacy, uh, which is something that... that both fellow panelists, I think, has, have harped on in, in multiple talks. Cool. Also, let, uh, let's transition a bit to um, responsible disclosure. Um, so there's a lot of different cultures surrounding responsible disclosure. There's like the academic IRB model. There's the, you know, sort of hacker just tweeted out model. Um, how what what do you what does responsible disclosure or what what responsibilities do you have when you're doing a pen test in in any of your fields um what should that look like so i've been going through irbs for the past month uh they don't like me um because i fight back on a lot of these things um and what is actually ethical like an ethics review board is not the like end all be all of ethics um for example the one i was dealing with is like you have to keep your raw data for seven years on the university servers and and they and i was like why and they said oh just in case like, no, <laughs> the, um, with science, the best way to have reproducible science is to release your data set, but you want to take care of your participants. So you anonymize it the best you can. You strip out as much data as you can and leave the bits that you need to get the stats that you got. So other people could get the same thing. If they took that data and your paper, um, they should be able to get the same results easily. And I said, yeah, like I'm going to, as soon as the raw data has been shifted over and I've anonymized it, I'm going to delete it. It'll be gone. And then they're like, no, and fighting it. And so this is an interesting thing because when we're talking about how much that data reveals um, and how much you can get out of it, if you haven't anonymized it and it's sitting there on a server and like, honestly, most people aren't there for seven years. Um, that would be a master's and a PhD in Canada and maybe some undergrad. That's a very long time. Who's maintaining that? Who's actually going to take it down? Who's actually making sure the data is safe? And so like, even then the ethics boards are like, well, I don't know. You have to, you have to take care of that. And it's like, it's seven years. Who's going to remember that later on, except for maybe a Google calendar update. This is, Hey, delete data. And it's like, what data, what did I do? Like, this is a problem. Um, and also with the ethics boards, uh, they are not usually geared towards specific fields. Um, an ethics board covers everything in the university. So they might be uh, biologists, they might be sociologists, they might be English professors, and then maybe you'll have a computer scientist. Like, they're not necessarily ready for AI or machine learning ethics applications, or even going through the methodology that's used, right? So this is another problem. No one verified my methodology in any of my experiments that I have put in for ethics. This is also a problem is, uh, I don't know how many people here had seen uh, the paper that came out a few months ago on telling people, telling whether people are gay or um, anything like that based on their face. Like, how is that ethical? Where was the ethics review board? It got ethics clearance, apparently. So, you know, this is an issue. That was all about hats and face hair. 
<laughs> well, and then this is the thing is uh, there is a company. People can ask me about after this outside. Um, but this is what they do is they collect people's faces at it, public places and they say, oh, yeah, it's for glasses and facial hair and hats and to see what the latest trends are so they can sell it to companies to see like what products are selling the best. But then they were talking about how at lunchtime they go through the facial hair pictures to make fun of people. Like, that's not great ethics. I can't even remember the question. Uh, responsible disclosure. Oh, God. Um, yeah, that, this can be an issue if you're doing something that's so new that nobody's really kind of... I, I mean, you talk to InfoSec people, they know that misinformation is an InfoSec problem. They know that it's a massive um, hack on people's brains and communities, but there's no real place to put it. It's like, we find stuff. We find stuff all the time, and all we can do is like a very quiet word with somebody in the right sort of place. So how do you tell people that a piece of their system that they don't even think of as a piece of system is broken and vulnerable, and that they're completely screwing up protecting it? On the other side, um, thank you, Anonymous, for releasing a huge pile of names of people who are connected to QAnon, but um, they're not the people we've seen. So. I, I mean, you've seen everything from us, like sometimes we keep stuff because we don't know where to put it and we don't want to do harm by putting it out to people just like chucking stuff out because, hey, it, it's hard. It's hard for us. And you're the industry person. Yeah. So. <laughs> it's uh, quite the label. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I think with responsible disclosure, um, uh, the thing that most interests me is we as a community have finally gotten really good, uh, I think reasonably good, at responsible disclosure for the vulnerability uh, research community. I, I, has anybody here participated in like bug bounties or, or anything like that, do vulnerability research? Yeah, a few people. We have guidelines and, and boards and clearing houses uh, and, and for the most part, proper steps to take to go and, and publish a uh, vulnerability for a network system or a piece of software for AI-backed security platforms, that doesn't exist at all. Um, yet we kind of open up <coughs> uh, these platforms to public view in places like VirusTotal, where you can test you know, your malware against a variety of uh, antiviruses. And then if you ha happen to pass one and you feel like vendor shaming or, or anything like that, or gaining publicity through tweeting, that's, that's an option on the table. There's no real uh, ethics or guidelines attached to that. And that is probably an opportunity for the adversarial research community to, to learn from the vulnerability research community and attempt to establish these sort of norms and, uh, uh, and guidelines. And this is sometimes where academia does come in um, because we aren't beholden to a company. Um, we don't have, like in Canada specifically, we don't have to worry about funding. Um, so you basically have a general grant that covers like privacy and security and you can do whatever you want under it essentially. So this is a, a good opportunity sometimes to work with academics who have more protections, um, who can publish this stuff out underneath the protection of a university and have the funding to do it. Whereas, you know, a company might be like, no, you're under us. We own your IP. You can't do that. Or maybe you're worried as a community group, like whether you'll personally be targeted. Um, of course, academics also do have that worry that we will be personally targeted but sometimes the university can help out with that or we can publish under the university generally and not put out specific names. So this is um, where definitely start talking to academics as well and we could bridge things a bit more to maybe help solve some of this problem. I mean, especially if you're a lone hacker or a lone view hackers, um, it can be pretty scary out there. You have, uh, it's an adversarial context. It's a seriously adversarial context and the risk is high. Can you think of any other like ethical, you know, um, just responsibilities or decisions or boundaries that you know exist in this space? I know we kind of already covered it. So if yeah, you I mean, I think what we're talking about and and what folks like uh, Sven and and Ariel and a few others who have gone over the the applied adversarial approach, doing this and and testing uh, vendor based AI platforms is is a murky area because you are 
inherently do, making the software do something different. Uh, and, and that's where I drew kind of the, the comparison to the vulnerability uh, research community, which is very much the same uh, idea. And, and that's, kind of, that's kind of where I was going, at least with my, do we partner with academia? Do we partner with impartial third parties or NGOs in an attempt to create some sort of uh, uh, clearinghouse uh, in order to generate or establish these, these norms? Yeah, I mean, it's like your data is broken, your access is broken, and your algorithm is broken. It's, it's, <laughs> who the hell do we, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, so the final question before we actually turn it over to audience and have audience ask some questions, um, how would you recommend someone get into the field or uh, these research areas? Yeah, I, I mean, a lot of people are doing it right now, going to things like AI Village, uh, Sarah leads an excellent conference that will be in Washington, D.C. I don't lead it. I'm just the program chair, but you should go. It's called CAMLIS, Conference on Applied Machine Learning and Information Security. And we're looking at both um, offensive, so attacking with machine learning. We're looking at defensive, defending with machine learning, and we're looking at attacking the algorithms themselves. So things covered AI Village. Also, MLSEC. We have a little problem with the website um, address, but if you look at MLSEC uh, as a Twitter, you should be able to find the community, join the Slack channels, join the long conversations we have. You covered it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was, the other thing would be just talk to people in the, in the room, follow, follow folks on Twitter if you don't have an account. Don't, you don't need to tweet, just follow people. It's such an excellent way to learn about what everybody in, in academia and industry is working on. I completely forgot. I've got a GitHub repo with listing to other people's repos of interesting things to read plus people to follow. 